Good evening. Uh, I think I'm nervous. I'm real nervous and let me say I'm happy to stand here in Oxford. I'm really happy to talk of myself and my success in sport, particularly in athletics. I want to start by introducing myself that uh, I am Eliud Kipchog. I was born a long time ago in 1984 in western part of Kenya. And I attended most of the primary schools, uh, two primary schools, got a secondary school. Uh, and you know, I, was, I didn't get a chance actually to further my studies by going to the college. But uh, reason is normal. That's the way in Africa reason is that my reason actually was uh, that uh, I was born and raised by a single parent. And we had a really, really limited resources to really to pay for my school fees. We are four in the family, and our mother uh, had a job of teaching in, a, in, in kindergarten. And the moment I was uh, finishing secondary school, my mother had already quit the job. And the only source of livelihood uh, to actually, it was actually uh, selling the local brew. That's what actually we were hitting. That's what makes us, uh, what makes me to stand here today is that uh, we get small money to buy clothes and buy food out of the local pool. And my neighbor was running and I say, I want to be like him and have a chance actually of uh, putting a plane to Europe. And I start training. Because I had no other choice. You either go to college and be successful, or look at a, at a means. Uh, I trained, and in two years' time, uh, I met my neighbor, who is actually my coach now, Patrick San. He gave me my facilities and program, and he used to check all those programs every two weeks. On those two weeks, I actually went to his farm and he checked what I've been doing and I was okay. He told me, you are okay and uh, continue like that. Uh, in the year 2001, there was a very good organization uh, cross country in Kenya and I tried my best. And I, it was a six series and I won five out of six. Uh, 2002, that was my first holding. I won a national championship that's junior in cross country. Whereby I got a chance to represent Kenya in Ireland, that's in Dublin. And I was placed the fifth position. I go back to Kenya to train. I had no chance of going back again, to coming back again to Europe. I trained very well. Joined the global, that year, global sports communication that year in December put in a cam of a trick song, and I won again the, 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 the cross-country series in Kenya. Six out of six, I won a national uh, cross-country championships. I got a gold medal in World Cross Country in Lausanne in, in Switzerland. And three months, four months down the line, that was, uh, I conquered the world by winning 5,000 meters in, uh, in France, that's in Paris beating the two big guys, that's HML Cruz and Karina Safekele. That was the beginning of my life in sport. In 2004, I qualified uh, for Olympic Games to the city whereby Olympic was born, that's in Athens. And I was placed at that, I got a bronze medal. 2005, uh, 2005 I actually, um, uh, I didn't attend any championship, but I went to World Cross Country and I was fourth. That's a senior category. 2006, I got a bronze medal in World Indo in Russia. 2007, I got a silver medal in World Championships in Osaka, that's in Japan. 2008, I got a silver medal in 5,000 meters in Olympic Games in Beijing. 2009, I was actually number five in 5,000 meters in World Championships in Berlin. 2010, I got a silver medal in 5,000 meters in Commonwealth Games in India. 2011, I was number 
four in 5,000 meters in Taeko. 2012 of that was actually my low moment. I missed their chance to Olympic Games in London. That was the, my 10 year career in track and field. Those 10 years, I managed to run under 13 minutes. For all 10 years, I managed to run uh, 33 in 1500 meters, 350 in a mile, 727 in 3000 meters, 1246 in 5000 meters, and 2649 in 10,000 meters. And I, was, I can say I am the first human being to run under 27 in 10 kilometers in a road in San Silvestre in Madrid, although it was not recognized, but I ran 2654. That was at the heat uh, of, uh, of New Year. Um, I had a big plan with my coach and my management after a ticket in track and field. Then I <coughs> change my mind and make transformation to the road. And in 2013, I tried my first marathon in Ambak, and I ran at 2.05.30. That was my first marathon. The second marathon was uh, in Berlin. That's in 2013 again on, in September. And I ran my personal time those, those days. That's in 2013. I ran 2.04. 05, and I was second behind Wilson Kipsang, who ran a world record. 2014, I ran 20500, and I, was, I, I won a Rotata Marathon. That year again, I went to Chicago, and I ran 20411. That was my second fastest time. And in 2015, that was my first time in London. And I won London for, the, my, for the first time with a time of 2.04.42. Uh, that year again, I go back to Berlin and I ran uh, 2.04.00. Although I had a bad day when my insoles plopped out of the shoe. But I say, because I had prepared very well and I had planned very well, the, the insoles cannot, cannot interrupt me, but I won the race by 20400. The following year, 2016, I came back to London for the second time. Thank you, Fedport, for welcoming me for the second time. Uh, I ran the second fastest time in history. That's 20305. I missed a, little, a couple of seconds. Uh, I missed the world record. And some months back, I really uh, I was really appointed to the team of Kenya to Olympic Games in Rio. I won a marathon in Rio, that's an Olympic Games, that's in last year. I got a gold medal. And some uh, two months after getting the, the gold medal, then they came this project called Tube the Breaking Two project, organized by the Nike. And I was offered a chance to actually be one of them, those who are actually going to try to run under two hours. It was un unthinkable, and I think to most of the people, still unthinkable. I say yes. I choose to be one of them. I took time. I trained for seven months. And on, fifth, on 6th of May 2017, in Monza, that's a Formula One track, I managed to run two hours flat and 25 seconds. And I'm happy to say and stand today that uh, the world is only 25 seconds away. <laughs> the world actually is uh, full of challenges. And we need to challenge ourselves. I took a challenge 
to run that fast. It's, it is really, it takes, it consumes a lot of energy, especially mentally. But I took myself and accepted to be challenged and I challenged the times. To all world actually was not actually accepted. I, I, when, I, when I go through the, uh, uh, the tweets for the fans in the whole world, most of them was not accepted. In fact, I had a friend in India who told me that uh, the guy is 50 years now, and he told me he will die before he see a human being running to our flat. I met him one month ago in New York, and I joked with him. You will never die again because you have seen me running two hours. <laughs> uh, two months ago, uh, I was in fight at Akwele Tran in Berlin Marathon. And I might be victorious by running two or three at two in Berlin. Uh, and I want to say, actually, all what I have done is due to some factors. As, as I am saying always, you cannot, in order for you to be successful, you need to consider some factors. One is self-discipline. Secondly is uh, very well preparation. Thirdly is uh, well, you should be well organized. Fourthly is you should think positive. Fifth is actually uh, working with people. Let me start with self-discipline. Uh, I can say self-discipline starts with you. It's not the other person. It starts with you. Start to examine yourself. And when you start to examine yourself, so self-discipline means it's doing what's right rather than doing what you feel like doing. That's the meaning of self-discipline. Uh, after actually accommodating self-discipline in your mind, self-discipline can help you in, to actually get three things. It can save your feelings, get, back, get you on back on the course. When you, when you try to think otherwise, then when you are self-disciplined, you can easily come back and think positively. It helps you to think, to actually do the right thing in the moment for long-term benefits. How can you handle this self-discipline? How can you cultivate this self-discipline? One is that you, sh you should stick to your priorities. Secondly is that don't make excuses. When you have decided to do something, do it. No excuses, then you are self-disciplined. Thirdly is that learn to say no, and that's final. Fourthly is that uh, you make discipline your lifestyle. Discipline is not one-time event. Self-discipline is like building your muscle. It's like going to the gym. You cannot go to the gym today and build your muscle. You should get a program and go slowly by slowly. That's the way to build your muscle. And that's the way discipline, that's the way you can hand and cultivate your, uh, your self-discipline. Remember, only the disciplined ones are free in life. I repeat again. Only the disciplined ones are free in life. If you are in discipline, you are a slave to your moods. You are a slave to your passions. That's a fact. Remember there is a quote which says, it's not even a quote, but uh, there is a sign which is there in one of the Nazareth schools in Canada. It displays, 
the best time to plant a tree was 25 years ago. That was the best time to plant a tree. It's there in the, in the walls, in the wall of that nursery school in, in Canada. The, best, the second and the best time is today. Plan the tree of self-discipline. I repeat again. When you visit that school, that Nazar school, that kindergarten school in, in, in Canada, it's written, the best time to plant a tree was 25 years ago. But the second and the best time to plant a tree of self-discipline is today. Today is that yet. It's the best time for you to plant a tree of self-discipline. Second factor on how to be successful is planning and preparation. Remember in sport, I believe in a philosophy whereby it says to win actually is not important. To be successful is not even important. But how to plan and prepare is critically crucial. That means when you are prepared very well, when you plan very well, then success can come on your way. Then winning can come on your way. Thirdly is that uh, you should get organized in what you are doing. Fourth is that uh, you should actually think positive in any profession. You should think positive. That's the driver of your mind. If, you, if your mind is really thinking positive, then you are on the right track. Remember it says, uh, Pleasure in what you are doing it was, is what puts perfection in your work. That was, the, uh, that, that was a quote by Aristotle. Fifth is uh, teamwork. I am here because of teamwork. I am here because sport is a mutual interest. I am here to talk of my success because I am really, I am really, I am really on to uh, teamwork. Teamwork actually helps a lot. Remember, in sport we have what to call the Eros formula. And if you are a hero, then you have a, a formula. And that formula says, 100% of myself is nothing compared to 1% of the whole team. And vice versa. That's 1% of the whole team is nothing compared to 100% of myself. And that's the meaning of teamwork. Sixth factor is consistency. The law of consistency. You should get motivated. And the motivation actually, motivation makes you to move. Motivation makes you to go forward. And in that motivation, if you want to be consistent, you should be, on the other hand, you should be disciplined. And what makes you to grow is discipline. And, di and when, you cook, when you bring motivation and discipline, then you can be consistent. And when you combine all together, they say if you want to grow, consistency is the key. I'm confidently saying that consistency is the key if you want to grow in any profession.
peat sport, peat law, peat uh, all sorts of professions. If you are not consistent, you cannot go anywhere. But consistency makes you to grow. The seventy one is that uh, be comfortable with being uncomfortable or being comfortable with with being out of your comfort zone. Accept change. In other words, I'm saying change actually is important. I know it's uncomfort it is it's not really comfortable to, to adopt change, but change in life of a human being, in life of any profession, is really important. But in change, you cannot be forced. I can guess in this house we are between 100 and 150, but everybody has a key to the gate of each change. If you have opened your gate of white and, well, and welcome ch a change, then you are on the right direction. If you have closed the, the door and throw away the key, then you will not be comfortable. Change is important thing. We should accept the change in any situation. The last factor is believing in yourself. Personally, I believe in what I am doing. To run a big marathon and win takes five months. But when, when I am in a starting line, my mind starts to ring what I've been doing for the last five months. I believe in my trainings. I treat myself as the best one in that line. Because my mind tells me you are the best and I am believing on what I've been doing for five, for five months. And I can run free. I can run free. And that's what actually has helped me to be successful. Uh, lastly is that uh, you should actually, by believing yourself, in May I believed on myself. And I ran against the unthinkable. The scientists in the whole world actually were busy in their laps and saying the first human being to run two hours or under two hours will be in the year 2075. 2075. We are still having 57 years for a human being to run two hours or under two hours. 57 years. But I approved them wrong last May. That by believing in yourself, I believe on myself and run unthinkable, the impossible. I trust that they are still in their laps and they are now thinking otherwise. I'm a strong believer in, in believing what actually, if you believe what you are doing, then you will be successful. Uh, you know, it, it, took, it took me seven months of hard work, and actually, not even hard work, I can say it was really hectic to think. And sometimes, you can sleep and wake up, and you thought it's 6 o'clock, but it's 11. But the seven months I trained to help me to actually consume all the tension, all the nervousness, and at the end of it, I achieved. For those few remarks, let me hand there and I will come back for Q&A.
Thank you. I'm the um, I'm the dessert, <laughs> rather than rather than the starter. Um, we had a very useful session up upstairs beforehand with some selected people, which um, made us nice and relaxed. Um, some of the things, some of the things that Elliot says are really fascinating. One of the things that you you really get sports people talking about is the journey properly. And if you put in perspective that when Eliud was a young boy, the world record for the marathon was 2720 or something like that. Probably Steve Jones, um, Great Britain and Wales. 2720. So his journey was understanding what the world record was, recognising it, being a kid and a million miles away from it, having to, having to get up to that level in the first place, and probably by the time he got there, it had already moved again a bit further, and then surpass it. And I think that, that while a lot of sp sports people talk about the, the outward signs of their success, medals and records and how much money they earned and things like that, the real success and the real feeling of... of of, of worthiness that sports people get is remembering their own, their own personal journey from where it all started and where it finished. And even if people don't go the whole way in a journey because there's other people who are better than them, the fact that people have gone through that journey is, um, is, is of real value. It was certainly something that um, I forgot in 1981 when um, I owned a nightclub in Luton called the Mad Hatter. Uh, 1981, of course, was the first year of the London Marathon. And um, at half past ten at night, having had a few, I have to say, um, a, a punter bet me that I wouldn't run the marathon next day. Now, I'd probably had half a dozen pints already. Um, I took the bet, it was a thousand pounds, and, and thought this was worthwhile doing. Um, I, I changed my lifestyle immediately. You must remember that this was after I finished running and I was rather unfit. But nonetheless, I thought I'd do what I could do. So I moved from beers to pina coladas, thinking a healthy drink would, <laughs> would be really helpful. Um, the club shut at two o'clock. And by the time we got the, the punters out, it was 2.30. And we went to a, uh, a local restaurant. Um, known as the Light of India, but affectionately known as the Shite. <laughs> and um, ha had a carbo-loading meal there. <laughs> Went to bed. Um, had to get up at 7 o'clock, was the first London Marathon started at 9 o'clock. And um, I managed to get to the uh, start line. I had phoned the race director, Chris Brasher, who, um, who organised the London Marathon. Um, so he was started the London Marathon was, and was actually here when Roger Bannister ran the first four minutes here. He was one of the pacemakers, later became an Olympic champion himself. And I said, is it OK if I run? He said, well, um, you know, why are you phoning me? You know, you'll do what you want to do because that's all you ever bloody do. And, <laughs> and he put the phone down. I went to the start, feeling pretty confident because there was still quite a bit of alcohol in the system. <laughs> The first half was a dream. Right? The first half was a dream. I went through halfway in probably about one hour twenty, something like that, feeling quite good and confident. And, <laughs> and then the vindaloo started to work its way <laughs> through the body, and I started to adopt a slightly different running style. <laughs> um, I was um, I was ill. Um, I, was, I was caught on television um, uh, puking into a drain. <laughs> um, and um, the, the last three miles took me 45 minutes. <laughs> um, I ran three hours 45, um, which, as you will know, is somewhat slower than, than, um, than uh, Elliot is doing. Um, but 
strangely enough, having moved from that period of my life back into working with London Marathon as being the race director, and one of the best things, best job you could ever have, be race director of London Marathon and be in charge of pushing the elite fields together. Just absolutely astounding. Certainly for an ex-athlete, you just can't beat it. And trying to work out which athletes you should have, um, who are the best athletes. And over the years, we've had some wonderful um, competitive events at London. Um, we've seen some amazing things. Khalid Kanucci um, in 2004, I think, or something like that. My memory's going, it would happen to you all. Um, uh, ran, had to break the world record in London, two hours, uh, two hours 5.36. Now, you know, Elliot would be two and a half minutes ahead of that. But he broke the world record. Paul Radcliffe running 2.15.25 when the world record was 2.18.30, right? Just completely annihilated it. Um, Dionisio Seron winning three times in a row. Something Elliot hasn't done yet, but um, with him running in London in, um, um, in April, um, you won't get very good odds that he doesn't do it, that's for certain. Um, you know, just some amazing, um, amazing performances. Paul Turgat, he mentioned, Haile Gabba Selassie, um, Liz McColgan winning, Eamon Martin. You know, just amazing, amazing, wonderful victories over the years. And um, um, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this last uh, 24 hours. Elliot, Elliot came into London yesterday and we spent some time together. And we are different people. I'm old, white hair. He hasn't got white hair yet, but he will do in time. <laughs> but the conversation's about the uh, two hours. And I think this happening at this time in Oxford is really quite amazing because when you read or if you read any of the stories leading up to the first four minute mile that everyone thought was impossible and it was beyond human ability. And then Roger Bannister here at Ifley Road smashes it. And this is exactly where we are with the marathon now. It's, it's going to happen. It's got some momentum and, you know, I'm I'm in the side of the business that builds things up and makes them sound great and everything else, right? But when Elliot tells me that I'll see it in my lifetime, my God, I'm going to believe him. And um, I think it's just been, um, it, it's a privilege knowing Elliot. I am pretty certain, he's not quite there at the moment, but I think another couple of races and we will be talking about the greatest distance runner the world has ever seen. And there have been some, Haile Gabba Selassie, Kenanisa Bikili, Emil Zatopek, you know, going back in time, you know, just you know, some amazing people, Ron Clark, 19 world records, just amazing, amazing performances in periods of time. And at the moment, he's only, he's only two-time Olympic champion, two different distances. He's only run 2.305, not even the world record holder at the moment, but he's only been beaten in one marathon and he will, I am certain, become the greatest distance runner the world has ever seen. Elio Kipchoge. Do you have more to say or do you want to open up to questions now? I'm I'm fine. However, Ellie, you do you have more? Do you want no. to open up to questions? Yes, yes. Yeah, so we're now going to open up to questions from the audience. If you have a question, raise your hand nice and high and wait for the microphone to come to you. The microphone is just for recording purposes, not uh, amplification. Uh, yeah, let's start with you. Uh, Ellie, looking, looking back at the, the race in Monza, do you think there was any aspect of your preparation or even the, the race conditions on the day that could have been improved leading to potentially an even faster time, in, in hindsight. Uh, thank you. Uh, in Monza, actually, I think it was well organized. Uh, the conditions were perfect. The organization, actually, the setup and everything was uh, uh, a plus. 
And I can say I, everything was okay and I don't need anything to be added or, or subtracted. So it was really perfect. That's why I, I, I really got that wonderful time. Great. Thank you for that question. Yeah, let's come to you just on the end here. Hi, Elid. So you have such a lovely technique. I was just wondering, is this something you've sort of always had or have you done a lot of technique work or mobility work to actually develop the technique that you have when you're running? Oh, the technique actually comes from, uh, you know, from our coach, from my coach personally. When we are training, you know, somebody is watching us and gives me a lot of techniques. And I, I'm really adopting them, and it has helped me a lot. Yeah. Great, thank you. That question. Yeah, let's just come to you across. Yeah, just a. Thank you so much for coming to Oxford. Uh, I watched your race at Monza. Stayed up all night in the U.S. to watch it. It was amazing. And and you're right. The race was perfect. I'm wondering, what to you is uh, the perfect race when you're not competing? Are you running? Uh, alone or with friends, and what are you thinking about? Is it in Kenya? Where is it? A, a perfect run on your own when you're not in competition. Where do you like to run? What do you like to think about? Uh, without competition, I can say the favorite run is, uh, I, I like running with my friends, but uh, all in all, we, when you're having a, a really a good race, then we are, we are, we are choking and we are talking a lot. Uh, yes. So we are, with my friends, then I am enjoying all uh, training with them and running with them. Would that be in Kenya, or is there a particular place that you? It's Kenya. Kenya. Yeah. Okay, there. Very quick there. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that question. Yeah, we, we'll just come for ease. Thank you for being here. You, you speak very, very well. Um, given everything you've achieved, how will you approach London? Is it about winning London? Is it about setting the world record? Is it about trying to go sub two hours? And do you make a plan beforehand or do you adjust? I was in Berlin when you ran and it was a horrible day of rain and humidity. Do you have to adjust your race strategy beforehand or do you plan the whole 26 miles and have a strategy? And for London, what will that be? Or will you need to improvise based on weather, conditions, etc.? Oh. When I'm approaching the rest, then it relies on what, how my training has been. But uh, to be specific, because you ask about London, is that uh, in April I'm planning to run a beautiful race in London. <laughs> yes. It, it's worth saying, it's worth saying this just to add, because um, uh, all, all we've done so far is announced Mo Farah and Elliot, um, but of course, loads of other people have been signed up, and we're just we're just starting <laughs> to tell the story. Um, to win London is harder than winning an Olympic Games. The best athletes in the world will be there, and not only they are the best athletes because they're the best athletes, but they will be coming wanting to be the very best athlete. And the only way they become the very best athlete is to beat Elliot. So, so there will be, there will be, sev there will be several guys who are wanting to beat him significantly. So he's going into a competition knowing that, that, that people want to knock him off his perch, knowing that he's in a race where he's already got very close to breaking the world record. Um, and, and perhaps if he, he'd been looking at the clock a bit more, and maybe did a bit less waving down the home street, <laughs> then, then maybe he would already be the world record holder. But the, these things happen. So I believe in... <laughs> and he missed out on the world record bonus as well, by the way, just, just, just for a note, OK? He, 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 his waving to his friends and mum cost him $100,000, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, don't think it doesn't matter. But so, so if the weather is good in London, he will have the stiffest competition that is possible. And when he says beautiful race, I, 
I take that to mean if he has to bait the world record to beat the others, then that, of course, goes without saying. So I, I look forward to it with anticipation. And I've seen loads of these, right? I've seen loads of Londons. And I can't remember being as excited as I am now looking forward to, to April. Great, thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, let's go to you and the glasses. Hi, Elliot. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really inspired. Um, thank you very much for sharing your tips as well on, you know, on, on the importance of discipline. But I'm really interested in being someone who's so super focused. Um, where does balance come in? You know, sometimes you can be pursuing one particular goal and neglect everything else. And so I'm interested um, in how you maintain a good balance while still pursuing, you know, your goals. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, concerning actually the concentration and how to, 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 to balance what's, uh, what I have in my both hands is, uh, uh, you know, in sport, there we, don't, we, we have a total concentration and we call it cocoon concentration. Cocoon concentration in sport is whereby you think about the sport in a positive way. So my mind actually is fixed on the sport, fixed on my trainings. And above all, I, talk, I, I am really strict on my workouts and all my programs. I am doing it to the perfection. It's like uh, when I missed one, it's like missing a discussion. Where, 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 uh, like classmates and you miss a discussion whereby you, you, maybe you had a group of six people discussing a subject. When I miss one training, then I will not even sleep well. Great, thank you. Thank you for that question. Yeah, let's go right to the very back. Yeah, great jumper. Oh, yeah, thanks uh, for coming to speak today. Um, I'm a professional squash player, and uh, the most I've ever done in my training is loads of 400s or 600s, um, slightly designed to mimic a squash rally. The one benefit of that is you know the pain's not far away from ending. Um, at what point do you hit that pain in a marathon and how do you manage it throughout two hours, potentially? Uh, actually, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, I'm really, when I, when I have a lot of pain, first let me start with pain. I'm trying to convince my mind to forget about pain, pain but think on the distance. When I think on the distance, I, I am trying all means to go through the distance. Because I don't want to, the pain to be in my mind and I will, fo and I will, I will really lose focus on, what, on, 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 on running. So I'm really concentrating purely on the distance and forget the pain. But after winning, then you will you, you, you not have that pain. <laughs> <laughs> but it comes later because marathon is hard and you know, the second day, you don't go up the stairs or down the stairs. <laughs> when you're focusing on that distance, do you break it down? Or do you think, OK, 13 miles to go, 12 miles to go? Or do you uh, think, OK, let's just get the next mile, then the next mile? In, in marathon, actually, the first half is just normal run. You don't concentrate even on the first half. That's, that's in marathon. Marathon starts after that. When you are still running 15K, 20K, then you have, you are, everybody's there. Where the marathon starts is after 30 kilometers. That's where you feel pain everywhere in your body. The muscle is really aging. And uh, uh, the most uh, prepared and well-organized athlete is really, is doing well after 30. So I, personally, I don't, con I, I, I don't, I, I don't say, 10 kilometers, I will do this, 20 kilometers. I will, I will go with the pace, but after 30 kilometers, I'll, I will change my own pace. And if you are ready actually to follow me, then we go together. <laughs> yes. Great, thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, let's come down to you. <coughs> hey, uh, thanks very much for the talk. Uh, so my question was regarding the self-discipline you actually talked about. 
So I was wondering that how strictly do you follow the self discipline in your routine? And, uh, and because you are actually, you want to break the world record or make new world records. And it's actually usually a matter of seconds and sometimes milliseconds. So how strictly do you like follow and you actually look at, at, at your goal? And then, and sometimes when you miss your recently short term goals, and what would you do then? Uh, world record is in my mind. It's in front of my head. That's in front of my mind. But uh, to be self-disciplined is that uh, I'm really committed to training. That's why I'm really in the camp on Monday to Saturday. And I don't miss any chance of training. I don't miss any chance of fitness. And that's the sign, actually, of, of, of really aiming to run a, a world record. Uh, in track, I'm really going the ideal time as well, but I go just say. In long run, I'm really on it. If it's 40 kilometers, then be it raining or, 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 really, or, or not raining, then I'm, I, I'm doing to the perfection. Uh, concerning when I miss a world record, I don't regret. When I miss a world record, I don't complain. If I recreate and complain, that's the sign of self discipline. So uh, I was uh, born and raised in a society whereby they, they actually uh, make an example of a tree, that a tree has a lot of branches. And when you are going up, you step each branch. So when you have already go, uh, go beyond another branch, you forget that branch, aim for the next. If I miss a world record, I forget it. I aim for the next one. Yeah. Great. We have time for one or maybe two more. Yeah, let's come to you. Hi, Elliot. Um, in an earlier um, occasion, you'd said that running for you is less about the legs and more about the heart and the mind. And I'm curious about, I mean, there's a lot of information available on how a runner can train their legs, but not so much on how one should go about training their mind. So how do you go about training that? And what is your advice to another runner on how you should get the right mind game before a run? Uh, I think actually uh, physical training and mental training, both of them are important. But you can be physically fit, but psycho psychologically poor. And you cannot do anything. If, the, 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 if you aim running 5,000 meters, uh, maybe at a time of 14 minutes, even if you are fit of running that 13 and a half minutes and your mind actually is poor, then you can run 16 minutes. But you are fit to run 13, 13. That's why I'm saying I am not running on my legs alone, but I'm running on my head with my heart and my mind. But uh, during the time of training, you should be physically fit. And uh, mental fitness actually plays a big role during competition. You know, if you don't rule your mind, your mind will rule you. That's the way I'm taking this sport. Great, thank you for that question. That is all we have time for. Uh, so please join me in thanking Elliot and David. <laughs> <laughs>